Somebody gets you uptight. How long do you decide to stay uptight? Well, you say, my body gets all tense and I can't look at the person and I get angry when I think about the person. Right, well, how long do you want to carry it? It's the oft-told but essence story of the... which we all by now know. We'll get so in our gatherings and tapes where we can just say story number 43 and everybody will say, ah, ah, so, you know. <laughs> the story of the two monks that come to the riverbank and there's a beautiful girl there who can't get across the river and one of the monks picks her up and carries her across and they continue to walk on silently, the two monks. And about two m hours later, the other monk says to the first, we're not supposed to touch women, you shouldn't have picked her up. And the first monk says, yes, but I put her down on the other side of the river. You've continued to carry her in your thoughts, is what he's saying. The hour and 59 minutes since I put her down, you have been profaning the universe by filling it full of those thoughts for me. New vector view, take one. If you can still your thoughts, then you become like a baby, like a newborn baby. Where, look, I am making all things new. The song in a show called Penny Candy, Candy for a Penny, it's told by a kind of a, a jaded woman who's now a very wealthy woman. She says, boy, I wish a penny meant to me what it used to. I wish I could experience the joy of what it meant to hold a penny in my fist. Jadedness, boredom are all thought forms. You think you have to go to California because it's there? How about India? Certainly it's not here, it must be there. Where do you think it's going to be? Temple in Nepal? A secret school in South America? Where do you suppose it'll be? Where will we find you, you elusive one? <laughs> oh, boy. What a great game. The game of hide and seek. First we hide it, and then we seek it. And we fool ourselves every time, don't we? Except the last time. When we finally sit down under the Bodhi tree and say, okay, baby, I've had it. Enough of that game. I'm not going to hide it so I don't have to seek it. I'll just be it for a while. I'll be home plate. You all can play. I'll just sit here and be home plate, okay? <laughs> Well, for some mysterious reason, we all can't seem to be home plate. We can't know we're home plate just yet. Some of us can see each other as home plate. I see you lurking in there, God, Ram, whoever. Well, what keeps us from being home plate are our thought forms, and our thought forms are... are, if you will, our karma. Or a set of habits, nothing more or less than a set of habits. If you've ever um, 
cod horn pout, catfish. You got to catch the catfish when you want to take it off the hook. You got to get your fingers in behind the back fin and over the front. If it sticks you with its fins, it, it, it's like a, a bee bite. You got to go in behind. It's a very slimy, slithery fish. So every time you go for it, it slides away from your hand. And there's a certain art to getting hold of a catfish, but once you got them that way, then you can remove the hook. If you happen to still be into fishing. <laughs> Putting a worm down the hook, right down the center of the worm. <coughs> And a catfish taking it off the hook, a horn pout, is like taking a habit off the hook, getting rid of a habit. You've got to catch it a certain way. Because if it gets on top of you, it'll just run off again. A lot of you say, well, I'm going to use tantric sexual practices to become enlightened. That seems like the best of all worlds. After all, sex is the thing that's gotten me the highest thus far. So I think I'll use that to get higher. Well, the tricky matter here is that there are a lot of really strong habits that you have connected with that whole routine. And some of those habits are so strong, they put you to sleep every time they start to run off. And the catfish stings again. Oh, it's great. Again. But you come down. come down. And it's only the extraordinarily apt and prepared fishermen who can catch a really groovy fish like that fish and outwit it to get it off the hook, to get it to throw it back, to let it live. Sometimes you don't want to take on such a, a very subtle fish at first. would be better to take on smaller fish, like a perch or a sunfish or something like that. Before you work up to a catfish. So you witness some desires and you get so that you watch your desires that aren't quite as powerful, the habits aren't quite as strong as that. A desire is merely thought around which pran or energy is mobilized. If you're going to desire something, desire something. Desire to be one with God. That's a groovy desire. Because that can use all the energy that comes into the system. Any desire less than that can't. Any dualistic desire can only handle so much energy. You desire to open your heart, to merge with the universe in love. Then don't sit around desiring it, just become your heart and open it and open. <laughs> Very simple. Like become your chest and expand. Become your back and loosen. That's how you do asanas, asanas, hatha yoga. You get to that place where your thing freezes, stops, and then with each little breath, you just loosen it a little and then loosen it a little more and loosen it a little more. You just go into that particular vertebra or that particular hip socket and you just become loose. Because your mind is so calm when you're doing asanas. See, when you start to understand that it's all thought forms and you dig that you want to get your house in order, you start to look around for all of the uncooked seeds, unexamined habits, and you keep bringing them into consciousness, and one by one you knock them off by bringing them into consciousness and getting them into harmony with the next place you're going.
Every habit of thought must change because who you thought you were, you aren't, and every thought is based on the specific relationship of that thought to the thinker, and you aren't that thinker anymore. So how could the thought be right? It's like a strong man trying to lift a rock, thinking he has the strength of a little child. Most people, when they eat, they're running off old habits. When they go to sleep, they're running off old habits. They wake up, they're running off old habits. When they make love, they're running off old habits. When they plan each day, they're running off old habits. They're like exquisite sleepwalking machines. Once you can find a center in yourself, just keep doing a mantra or... Sing engrossed is the bee of my mind, or chant om, or look at a candle flame, or listen to the sound inside your head. Then you see the mechanicalness of it all. You see the habits. One by one, you bring them into awareness, and every habit you bring into full awareness you burn through its rigidity by your awareness, and from then on you are free of that habit, free of that attachment. I went to see a movie, Woodstock, last week, which may be the last movie I ever have to see. I think as movies go, it was enough. Right? It had a cast of 300,000. All star players, perfectly cast. And it was an essence contact high. It was a statement of is. Even to the number of times everybody on the microphone had to keep reassure, reassuring us that we are. That's is too. People have been calling, inviting me to come to peace and love festivals throughout the country this summer and been planning for Mr. Nixon to send telegrams to all the festivals and so on. Planning freedom trains. And I've been wondering how long, how long we have to keep gathering to reassure ourselves that it's all right to be high. How many numbers does it take to turn you on, meaning to give you the faith to let it happen within you? I mean, if you can't walk naked by yourself, maybe if 10,000 other people walk naked, you can walk naked. Or maybe it only takes 50. Or maybe it only takes one. Or maybe it only takes somebody saying to you, you want to walk naked? Now, what's your tolerance point? How much, how much, how much added energy do you need to feed into the system before you go over the edge, into the here and now? How corroded are the habits? How closed are the doors? How much lubrication does it take? One joint? A hundred high people? A Unitarian minister asked me the other day, Dr. Alpert, are you equating taking a pill with hearing a minister on Sunday morning? <laughs> and I answered, that depends on the minister. What we're all waking up to is we're all really hooked. We're really addicted, but we're not addicted to all those things that they write about in Life magazine. See, we're addicted to the spirit. We're addicted to coming out of the sphere in the right direction. Come into the sphere, and there are two ways you can go out. One is you can go out by denying the despair by trying to do more of what you did before. So if you get despaired with a Ford, you buy a Pontiac, 
Yet the spirit of a Pontiac, try a Cadillac. Try a Jaguar, try a Rolls Royce. Then you can have Rolls Royce to spear. That's one way of getting out of despair, doing more of what you were doing before. That's denial of despair, pushing it away. The other is to say, hi, baby, hello, despair, let's go, and be despairing. Really despair. Ugh. And out of that, ugh, that's the other way out. That's way out. That way out brings you into the spirit, and that's much higher than all the ways you were trying to get out the other way. That's called coming into the spirit, into the light. It's where it's all harmonious. You know that feeling you get now and then where it's all just the way it's supposed to be? Wow, man, I see it all. It's all just perfect. Wow, dig that. Suffering from euphoria. In the world as horrible as it is now, how could you possibly think it's all right? What kind of drug have you taken to induce this Pollyanna-ish idea that the universe is just the way it's supposed to be? If everybody thought that way, do you know what would happen? <laughs> do you? <laughs> Oh, uh, fall apart, wouldn't it? That's really bad. We're addicted to the spirit, but because we don't label it quite right yet, we get addicted to the methods we use to get to the spirit. For some people it's acid, for some people it's eating, for some people it's swimming, for some people it's whatever it is. Some people have so much despair and they, they're cynical and they don't think that there is any place out of it, so they just want to avoid the suffering. And those are the people that get hooked on heroin. I had a hitchhiker that was going to Florida recently. And he was just up to Boston to score some heroin to sell in Miami. He told me trustingly. <laughs> and I went through all of my inner indignation and uptightness and moralizing. And, <clears throat> and if I drive him to New York, am I aiding and abetting the... Then I just turned that all off and I listened. And he said, hey man, I'd hate to live in Boston, but I guess that's why all the people on the street use heroin, because man, it's cold up there. See, if the pain's too great, the fear's too much, just turn it off. Shoot up and turn it off. <laughs> Then it starts to turn on again, you get more, shoot up again. Got to use a little more, but price going up, but, and so on. It's an old story to everybody. The thing of avoiding despair by denying it is that every time it comes back again. It's built into the system. It's a rule of the game. There's no choice whatsoever. No matter how cute you think you've gotten, even to suicide, it's never acute enough. Because wait till you see how it is on the other side when you understand your predicament you don't have a body to do it with. Because you just blew it. <laughs> Laugh, go ahead. <laughs> but right livelihood and truth and non-stealing and non-killing and psychedelics and love and hatha yoga and meditation and simplicity of diet. These are all vehicles 
that don't lead to withdrawal from despair by denial. They lead to transmuting energy, converting the despair into the spirit, consecrating life, making the sacred, making the profane sacred. That's what the whole trip is about. That's what the whole trip is about. Kindness, charity, not imposing your game on other people. Service, surrender, listening. All methods. Come into the spirit. That's what we're addicted to, feeling good, but feeling so good that there isn't even a bad in the good. Or that the bad and the good are both part of the feeling good. The total acceptance of the polar opposite is included in the feeling of well-being. Every time you experience well-being because you exclude something else, like you experience well-being at being alive because you deny the thought of death, you experience well-being because of youth because you deny age, you experience well-being because you're among, quote, your own, because you deny them. The sense of well-being is never total, because it always involves a certain amount of energy that had to be left out to keep the other, keep them away, out of your mind. Either repression or suppression, depending on how hip you are. Total contentment with the moment means accepting the moment just the way it all is right at this moment with death and old age and war and killing and love and peace and going to the toilet and bugs that bite and cherries that are fresh and babies that are beautiful and dogs and grass and spring and intestines and hurts in the knee and the hot sun and the cold night that's to come and the winter next year and all the hassles that exist and the undigested piece of something. It's all here and now and it's all just enough. That is the doorway that Christ refers to as the narrow gate. Narrow is the gate. Because you see, to be content and say it's just enough, <clears throat> you can't simultaneously really be desiring anything, can you? If you were desiring something, you would have to suspect that it wasn't enough. I mean, it would really be enough if... if. Last summer, I told a story here. I, just for continuity, I'll tell a story again. I was picking up a guy in last spring, a year ago, in Big Sur, in my old Buick, and it was a beautiful day, and we were going down the coast, and the ocean was all aqua-colored and all different colors, and the mountains to the left were fresh greens from the rains, and the road was curving around these beautiful rocks, and the old Buick, the 38 Buick, was chugging along with its romance and its gentleness, and its huge, heavy weight, and I was like, ah, you know, I was just turning into a, you know, turning into a drop of bliss. 
And this fellow, I said to him, look at those waves. That was my fault, of course. I said, look at those waves. <laughs> and he said, I don't think they're very good for surfing. <laughs> so that brought me down about two notches. So I looked to the left and I looked at the hills and I said, look at those hills. And he said, don't you wish you had a horse? And in two fell swoops, he had gotten me so I had to look straight ahead to find fulfillment any longer. If you want light in the world, be light. Fill your heart with light, fill your thoughts with light. And then everything you look at, if there are two choices, one is to look at it the old way, which keeps the paranoia going, and the other is to look at it as light that is just in the process of manifesting. You'll always pick the second way. And that'll always help it happen. Just keep your mind engrossed like a bee at the feet of the Divine Mother. See Ram every way you look. Consecrate your life. Just fill it with, fill it with the universe as light. I'll tell you a really good place to start if you're going to help mankind is to develop some compassion for yourself. It's a really good place to start. 